the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. So welcome back to another edition of my Midnight Special, which is where I sit on the back porch of my house late at night with my Labrador Griffin at my feet, and I try to read some stories for y'all because I can't sleep. And tonight I wanted to go into 10 different poems that I think every young man should know, or at least poems that were really interesting to me anyway. The reason is because tomorrow is my sister Genevieve's birthday, and she's a poetry lover, and I thought this might make a really good birthday gift. Now, it's not going to be any of that modernist trash that is called poetry. I'm going to read you an example of that right here. It's called Fog by Carl Sandburg. This is the entirety of the poem. The fog comes in on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. That's it. That's the whole poem, and I hate that type of poetry. I think good poems should convey a truth, illustrate a scene, or just tell a good story. And if it can do all of those three things and rhyme beautifully, it's perfect. So here are my top 10 favorite poems. Some of them are abridged, keep in mind. And I hope that you'll enjoy them as much as I have. The Master's Call by Martin David Robinson. When I was but a young man, I was wild and full of fire, a youth within my teens, but full of challenge and desire. I ran away from home and left my mother and my dad. I know it grieved them so to think their only boy was bad. I fell in with an outlaw band. Their names were known quite well. How many times we robbed and plundered, I could never tell. This kind of sinful living leads only to a fall. I learned that much and more the night I heard my master call. One night we rustled cattle, a thousand head or so, and started them out on the trail that leads to Mexico. But a norther started blowing and lightning flashed about. I thought someone was calling me. I thought I heard a shout. Then at that moment lightning struck not twenty yards from me and left there was a giant cross where once there was a tree. And this time I knew I heard a voice, a voice so sweet and strange, a voice that came from everywhere, a voice that called my name. So frightened I was thinking of sinful deeds I'd done. I failed to see the thousand head of cattle start to run. The cattle they stampeded were running all around. My pony ran but stumbled and it threw me to the ground. I felt the end was nearing, that death would be the price, when a mighty bolt of lightning showed the face of Jesus Christ. And I cried, O oh Lord, forgive me, don't let it happen now. I want to live for you alone, O oh God, these words I vow. My wicked past unfolded, I thought of wasted years, when another bolt of lightning killed a hundred head of steers, and the others rushed on by me, and I was left to live. The master had a reason. Life is his to take or give. A miracle performed that night. I wasn't meant to die. The dead ones formed a barricade, least six or seven high, and right behind it there was I, afraid but safe and sound. I cried and begged for mercy, kneeling there upon the ground. A pardon I was granted, my sinful soul set free. No more to fear the angry waves upon life's stormy sea. Forgiven by the love of God, a love that will remain, I gave my life and soul the night the Savior called my name. The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him, and under running laughter, up vistaed hopes I sped and shot precipitated, adown titanic glooms of chasmed hears, from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. I pleaded, outlaw, wise by many a hearted casement, 
curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities. For though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest having him I should have not beside. But if one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade as love wist to pursue. Across the margin of the world I fled, and troubled the gold gateways of the stars, smiting for shelter on the clanged bars, fretted to dulcet jars in silvern chatter the pale ports of the moon. Now this next one's a little weird, okay? I, I know Edgar Allan Poe is odd, but I had to include it because Poe, although a complete weirdo, is a master at prose. Don't worry, I shortened it. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly had I sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here for evermore. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. The Power of the Dog by Rudyard Kipling The power of the dog extols the dog's most famous virtue, its undying loyalty and devotion to its owner, but also warns against giving your heart to a dog for it to tear. Dogs for Kipling are not just man's best friend, they are heartbreakers. The Power of the Dog there is sorrow enough in the natural way from men and women to fill our day. And when we are certain of sorrow in store, why do we always arrange for more? Brothers and sisters, I bid you beware of giving your heart to a dog to tear. Buy a pup and your money will buy love unflinching that cannot lie. Perfect passion and worship fed by a kick in the ribs or a pat on the head. Nevertheless, it is hardly fair to risk your heart for a dog to tear. When the fourteen years which nature permits are closing in asthma or tumor or fits, and the vet's unspoken prescription runs 
to lethal chambers or loaded guns, then you will find it's your own affair, but you've given your heart to a dog to tear. When the body that lived at your single will with its whimper of welcome is stilled, how still, when the spirit that answered your every mood is gone wherever it goes for good, you will discover how much you care and will give your heart to a dog to tear. We've sorrow enough in the natural way when it comes to burying Christian clay. Our loves are not given but only lent at compound interest of cent per cent. Though it is not always the case, I believe, that the longer we've kept him, the more do we grieve. For when debts are payable, right or wrong, a short-time loan is as bad as a long. So why in heaven, before we are there, should we give our hearts to a dog to tear? If by Rudyard Kipling If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, but don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give away to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn-out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. Or I, I would also add, God, which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. In Flanders Fields by John McRae In Flanders Fields is a rondo written by the Canadian poet, soldier, and physician John McRae. McRae wrote the poem in 1915 as a memorial to those who died in a World War I battle fought in a region of Belgium. McRae himself treated many of the soldiers injured in that battle and was particularly moved by the death of a close friend, Alexis Helmer. The poem describes the tragedy of the soldiers' deaths as well as the ongoing natural beauty that surrounds their graves. It also addresses the question of the next generation's responsibility to carry on the soldier's battle. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the lark still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. The Dogwood Tree by Anonymous. When Christ was on the earth, the dogwood grew to a towering size with a lovely hue. Its branches were strong and interwoven, and for Christ's cross its timbers were chosen. Being distressed at the use of the wood, Christ made a promise which still holds good. 
Not ever again shall the dogwood grow to be large enough for a tree, and so slender and twisted it shall always be, with cross-shaped blossoms for all to see. The petals shall have bloodstains marked brown, and in the blossom's center a thorny crown. All who see it will think of me, nailed to a cross from a dogwood tree. Protected and cherished this tree shall be, a reflection to all of my agony. The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron The Destruction of Sennacherib was published by Lord Byron in 1815 as part of the book Hebrew Melodies. The poem was written to be accompanied by music. The poem retells the biblical story of the siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrian king Sennacherib, during which, according to the Bible, God destroyed the entire Assyrian army in the middle of the night. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen, like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast, and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed, and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And there lay the steed with his nostril all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride, and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, and cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail, and the tents were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpet unblown. And the widows of Ashur are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal, and the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted the snow in the glance of the Lord. Now the final one I've already recorded in a previous podcast. It's called The Mantle of St. John de Matha by John Greenleaf Whittier. St. John of Matha lived around the early 1200s and had an order in honor of the Blessed Trinity for the redemption of Christian captives of the Muslims. The poem tells the story of how he was trying to escape Tunisia with 140 Christian souls whom he had rescued from captivity. But even though St. John had paid their ransom, the Muslims weren't having it and wanted to see his ship founder. The scoundrels cut his sails to ribbons and thought that that would fix him. But God had other plans, and told St. John to use his mantle as a sail, which miraculously worked. It was an incredible chapter in Catholic history, forever immortalized by John Greenleaf Whittier. So now I'll play the podcast that I've previously recorded, and I just want to thank you all so much for listening, and uh, I apologize for any car sounds or whimpering made by my dog Griffin. Thank you so much for joining me, and Godspeed. This is The Mantle of St. John de Matha, a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier. A strong and mighty angel, calm, terrible, and bright, the cross and blended red and blue upon his mantle white. Two captives by him kneeling, each on his broken chain, saying praise to God who raiseth the dead to life again. Dropping his cross-wrought mantle, Wear this, the angel said. Take thou, O freedom's priest, its sign, the white, the blue, and red. Then rose up John de Matha in the strength the Lord Christ gave, and begged through all the land of France the ransom of the slave. The gates of tower and castle before him open flew, the drawbridge at his coming fell, the door bolt backward drew. For all men owned his errand and paid his righteous tax, and the hearts of lord and peasant were in his hands as wax. At last, outbound from Tunis, his bark her anchor weighed, freighted with seven score Christian souls whose ransom he had paid. But, torn by pain and hatred, her sails and tatters hung, and on the wild waves rudderless, a shattered hulk she swung. 
God save us, cried the captain, for naught can man avail. O oh, woe betide the ship that lacks her rudder and her sail. Behind us are the moormen, at sea we sink or strand. There's death upon the water, there's death upon the land. Then up spake John de Matha, God's errands never fail. Take thou the mantle which I wear, and make of it a sail. They raised the cross-wrought mantle, the blue, the white, the red, and straight before the wind offshore the ship of freedom sped. God help us, cried the seamen, for vain is mortal skill. The good ship on a stormy sea is drifting at its will. Then up spake John de Matha, my mariners never fear. The Lord whose breath has filled her sail may well our vessel steer. So on through storm and darkness they drove for weary hours, and lo, the third gray morning shone on Ostia's friendly towers. And on the walls the watchers, the ship of mercy knew, they knew far off its holy cross, the red, the white, and blue. And the bells in all the steeples rang out in glad accord to welcome home to Christian soil the ransomed of the Lord. So runs the ancient legend by bard and painter told, and lo, the cycle rounds again, the new is as the old. With rudder foully broken and sails by traitors torn, our country on a midnight sea is waiting for the morn. Before her, nameless terror, behind the pirate foe, the clouds are black above her, the sea is white below. The hope of all who suffer, the dread of all who wrong, she drifts in darkness and in storm. How long, O oh Lord, how long? But courage, O oh my mariners, ye shall not suffer wreck, while up to God the freedmen's prayers are rising from your deck. Is not your sail the banner which God hath blessed anew, the mantle that Damatha wore, the red, the white, the blue? Its hues are all of heaven, the red of sunset's dye, the whiteness of the moonlit cloud, the blue of morning sky. Wait cheerily then, O mariners, for daylight and for land. The breath of God is in your sail, your rudder is his hand. Sail on, sail on, deep freighted, with blessings and with hopes. The saints of old with shadowy hands are pulling at your ropes. Behind ye holy martyrs, uplift the palm and crown, before ye unborn ages send their benedictions down. Take heart from John de Matha, God's errands never fail. Sweep on through storm and darkness, the thunder and the hail. Sail on, the morning cometh, the port ye yet shall win, and all the bells of God shall ring, the good ship bravely end.